Hello, and welcome to Mission San Luis, a 17th century Spanish mission to the Appalachian Indians. I'm Jerry Lee, and I'm an archaeologist with Florida's Bureau of Archaeological Research, stationed here at the mission. Today, I'd like to share with you some information about the church at San Luis. Now, as you may know, this site of San Luis is actually the second location of the mission. It was in this spot from about 1656 until the threat of attack by the English and their allies forced its abandonment in 1704. San Luis was never a typical mission since a considerable number of Spaniards, friars, soldiers, administrators, and civilians resided here. A census from 1675 reveals that San Luis served 1,400 Appalachians, making it the largest Spanish Appalachian mission at that time. San Luis served as the provincial capital. The Spaniards had many interests in Appalachian province, the area between the Osceola and Ocalocne rivers, and the homeland of the Appalachians. One of those interests was to remake the Appalachians into loyal subjects of the Spanish crown and convert them to the Catholic faith. By the early 1670s, Appalachian province was described as thoroughly Christianized. The church was probably one of the earliest public structures at San Luis, and it opened onto the northwest edge of the central plaza of the town. It was the largest structure in the religious complex at San Luis, which consisted of the church, friary, and kitchen. Mission churches, through their size, along with their architecture and decoration, were meant to instill a sense of awe and wonder in the worshipers. The church was built by the Appalachians, who by that time were skilled in construction. The Bishop of Cuba, who visited the mission provinces in the 1670s, related that the mission Indians in general were great carpenters, as is evidenced by the construction of their wooden churches, which are large and painstakingly wrought. San Luis Church certainly filled the bill on that statement. It was a mostly wooden structure, and it was very large. The church measured about 34 by 15 meters, or roughly 110 feet long by 50 feet wide, about the same size as the main church in St. Augustine. It was placed at a northwest to southeast orientation, pretty close to the angle of what we believe was the royal road that extended from San Luis to St. Augustine on the Atlantic coast. Well, let's first take a virtual tour of the 17th century church, beginning just outside the main entrance that opened onto the plaza. There was a possible post mold, a discoloration in the ground that is evidence of where a wooden post burned or decayed that was pretty much in line with the south wall of the church, but clearly outside the church's eastern wall. We called it Area 461. I think Area 461 is evidence of an atrio outside the church. Atrios were walled courtyards at the entrances of churches, and these open spaces were commonly used for overflow of congregants, for outdoor services, and for burial. Now, a single possible post mold is pretty meager evidence for a walled courtyard at the church entrance. However, we did find burial pits east of the church's entrance, and a remote sensing survey identified other anomalies out here that may represent burials. Taken together, I think there's some evidence for a formal atrio. The primary entrance of the church was probably large double doors stretching between post molds 61 and 62 in the east wall. A disturbance we called Area 518 was on the center line of the structure and was likely where the two doors met. Walking through the doors, you would have seen two rows of large interior support posts that braced the church. There were additional support posts in the area close to the entrance. A loft above and just inside the entrance where a choir would sing was an element in some 17th century churches. 
We, be, we believe the additional bracing near the entrance was necessary to hold up a choir loft. Some churches had a stairway to access the choir loft, but a simple ladder was probably more often used. If there was a stairway in San Luis Church, we didn't excavate in the right place to see it. If you looked to the left as you walked in, you would have seen the baptistry with its baptismal font. What we found archeologically was the carved limestone base of the baptismal font. It was circular, a little over two feet in diameter and about six inches thick. There was a circular four inch diameter hole in its center that was apparently meant to accept the base of a tenoned post or something similar to hold the font itself. It doesn't appear that the baptistry was screened off from the open part of the church, but we also didn't take our excavations very deep here. That main open area of the church is called the nave. There wouldn't have been any seats or pews. People stood or kneeled during mass. In the 17th century, worshipers were segregated by sex, men on one side of the church and women on the other. You would notice some sort of carved limestone elements at four points within the nave, two near the east end and two at the west end. We recovered blocks and fragments of limestone in and near post molds 30 and 13 at the west end of the nave and in post mold 64 at the east end of the nave. The fourth point was not excavated, but when the church was reconstructed, a block of limestone was encountered where we, would, where we believe another of the major supports was positioned. We call that block feature 97. None of the limestone was preserved very well. It was all fragmented, very soft and weathered. It was definitely formed into decorative elements. Tool marks could be recognized on some of the fragments, and at least some of them were painted red. As in most mission churches, the nave of San Luis Church was also used as a cemetery. Based on the fraction of the nave that we excavated to undisturbed soil beneath the burials, the burial population is estimated at 700 to 900 individuals, and I believe it would certainly be at the higher end of those numbers. These were Christian burials, supine on the back with hands clasped at the chest. There was evidence that burials at the west end of the nave were treated differently than those in the greater part of the nave. There were seven burials in coffins, pretty unusual for mission cemeteries, and all seven were located at the west end of the nave. Why would that be? Well, among Catholics of that time, the preferred burial location was close to the church's altar. It looks like many of the Appalachian elite were buried in the West End, closer to the altar. If worship was segregated by sex, burial apparently was not. Males and females, young and elderly, were all represented in those portions of the cemetery that we investigated. In fact, among those seven Western coffin burials, men, women, and a juvenile were identified. Burials initially may have been in orderly rows, but that order was obscured as the cemetery filled. Post molds 13 and 30 bounded the west end of the nave and the sanctuary was just beyond them. A railing further separated the nave from the focus of the church, the altar. The space the altar occupied was represented by a subrectangular pad of orange clay. The clay pad served to elevate the altar table above the nave. In the middle of that clay pad was a disturbed area. We called it area 382. This was a pit that was dug beneath the altar after the church had been burned. It may be that when the English allied Indians reached San Luis soon after it had been abandoned, they dug beneath the altar, looking for any church silver the Spaniards may have hidden there. To the right of the altar 
was a very well-defined room measuring about 13 feet on each side. In the typical Spanish colonial church layout, the sacristy, where vestments and supplies for celebrating mass were stored, was located at the opposite end of the church and on the opposite side of the church from the baptistry. The room to the right was the sacristy. Another similarly sized room occupied the left side of the sanctuary, although it wasn't as well defined. This room was the counter sacristy. There's no doubt that the church was primarily a wooden or plank building. We found very little fired clay over most of the structure, but recovered thousands of wrought nails and spikes, the hardware that held all those wooden members together. Botanical specialists identified the wood from two posts in the church. Post mold 12 in the corner of the sacristy was not fully carbonized when the church burned and it was determined to be cypress. Wood fragments from one of the posts in the north wall of the sacristy were identified as pine. There were greater amounts of fired clay in the sanctuary portion of the church and some of it was daub with the impressions of the wooden elements it was plastered over. It appears that the sanctuary was also set off from the rest of the church with a different construction method. Waddle and Daw building techniques were used to some degree in the sanctuary. Curiously, none of the daub in the sanctuary was whitewashed, or at least no whitewash was preserved on any of it. Colonial churches often had a doorway from the sacristy to the outside. Beyond the church to the west, and especially behind the sacristy, were a series of areas, some of them small pits, an activity area that suggests just that sort of a doorway to the outside in the back of the sacristy. What might the interior of the church have looked like in the late 17th century? Well, we do have some information about that. The Spaniards were great record keepers, and two inventories of church furnishings have been located. The first is an overall inventory of the furnishings of the 34 churches in the Mission provinces of La Florida in 1681. The second, from 1704, is an inventory of the church furnishings carried out of Appalachian province with the retreating Spaniards. Both inventories list the vestments worn by the friars during mass and all of the various items used for its celebration. They also include the silver and brass sacred vessels, processional crosses, incense burners, and images, which were paintings, engravings, and statues. The inventories give the impression that the mission churches were richly endowed with everything the friars needed to care for their congregants' spiritual lives. The average church in 1681, for instance, had a dozen or so paintings of saints or religious scenes and five or six statues. Since San Luis was the provincial capital, its church may have been more richly supplied and decorated than an average mission church. Now, there aren't many artifacts from the church at San Luis that indicate this, but there may be a few, even beyond the four limestone elements that decorated the nave. Just east of the railing that separated the nave from the sanctuary, between post molds 30 and 46, we found a deposit of wood fragments that hadn't been completely carbonized. We called it Area 444 and removed it in a block on a big tray. As the wood dried, it began to separate from the soils around it, and we noticed gold-colored flecks on it, not solidly, but just numerous flecks. It turned out that the most common elements identified from the flecks were lead, mercury, and gold. Now, reredos, or ornamental metal panels, that decorated the area behind the altar in some churches. The 1681 inventory listed three reredos in the 34 mission churches in La Florida, and two were gilded. It's possible that San Luis Church was one of the three. 
1704 inventory, however, doesn't list any Reredos saved from San Luis or any of the Appalachian Mission churches. Since the gold-flecked wood of Area 444 was confined to one small spot near the sanctuary, it's probably more likely to be the remains of some other type of gilded church furniture. A silver alloy object in four fragments was recovered from the upper floor deposits of the church near the middle of the nave. I wish I could say that its Trinitarian aspect was immediately recognized. It's a trident, after all. But that's not the case. The three prongs are beveled. The edges of them are carefully finished. They were meant to be seen in the round. The single point opposite the prongs is not treated the same way because it wasn't meant to be seen. The two inventories both list silver crowns and halos. The 1704 list specifically mentions that six silver nine-rayed halos for the infant Jesus were taken back to St. Augustine. I see this object as evidence of statuary in San Luis Church. I think that this trident was one of multiple tridents meant to be inserted around the head of a wooden statue to represent a halo. The 1704 abandonment of the mission was carried out somewhat systematically. Church furnishings from San Luis Church and a few other remaining mission churches were loaded onto carts, horses, and Indians' backs to be carried to St. Augustine. The Spanish officer who was in charge of the eastward retreat said that many other items and furnishings could have been saved had he had more horses and people to carry them. The materials they couldn't bring out were burned, except for the large mission bells, which were buried. So what else did we find in the church? One thing that really stands out is the number of fragments of olive jar. Olive jars were larger imported ceramic vessels that were used for storage and transport. We counted over 13,000 fragments from the church excavations, a little over 200 from the nave, about 9,400 from the sanctuary, and about 3,500 from the units outside the church, and most of these came from the units just west of the church. Both the sacramental wine and the olive oil used in the church would have been stored in olive jars. The greatest single concentration of olive jar fragments was in the disturbed area, area 382, beneath where the altar stood. It held nearly 3,000 olive jar fragments. There was also a clear concentration of olive jar sherds within the sacristy, suggesting that wine and oils were stored here along with the vestments and other supplies. The higher numbers of olive jar increased the percentage of imported pottery in the church to nearly three quarters of the overall ceramic assemblage, a higher percentage than any other structural context at San Luis thus far. One type of Appalachian pottery was also found in a very neat pattern. You may be aware that at San Luis, along with their traditional native pottery, Appalachian potters produced copies of European vessels for the Spaniards, like brimmed plates, pitchers, and cups. Archaeologists call these sherds copyware or colonoware. Appalachian potters also made colonoware candle holders, and we find a few fragments of them here and there, especially in the Spanish village. In the church, however, we identified nearly 300 fragments of colonoware candle holders, and all but eight of them were found in the sanctuary or outside the church behind the sacristy. One small pit behind the sacristy held 70 or so fragments of the colonoware candle holders. They'd been broken during use in the church and had been swept up and discarded. Many brass candle holders, along with a few of silver, are among the items mentioned in the 1681 inventory, and San Luis Church must have held several. They aren't listed in the 1704 inventory of items removed from the province, 
and it's possible that, like the bells, brass candle holders might have been buried. Regardless, it's clear that Appalachian potters were continually producing these colonial candle holders, one of their contributions to worship in the mission church. Besides the candle holders, the Appalachian potters produced other vessels for the church. One, recovered in fragments from the sanctuary, appears to be a little square or rectangular tray with something like spouts at the corners. I'm not certain of its function, but it has a foot ring base, so it's definitely colonial wear. A native made ceramic disc was recovered in fragments from the sanctuary that I think was the lid to an incensario. Incense, likely imported from New Spain, was an important part of religious services. Many mission churches had incense containers and spoons, often of silver, and some are recorded in the 17 inventory of furnishings removed from the province. What we found in the sanctuary at San Luis was much of a circular perforated pottery disc. I think it covered a sort of small ceramic or even metal bowl in which incense was burned with the smoke wafting up through the perforations. This possible cover probably just supplemented the silver censers that San Luis Church no doubt held. Brass book hardware was recovered exclusively from the sanctuary end of the church. At least we think it's book hardware. By the time San Luis was moved to this location, metal clasps to keep books closed were uncommon. Apparent book clasps have been recovered from several Appalachian missions, however, so it may be that religious books, Bibles, missals, or breviaries, continued to use metal hardware as closures. At San Luis Church, the mission bells marked out the days, calling people to worship or to work. We recovered a few bell fragments from the church. Two of them are from larger brass or bronze bells, and both were recovered from the east end of the church. They could be fragments of the primary church bells but records from 1704 expressly tell us that those bells were buried for later retrieval since they were so heavy. One of them is a lip fragment from an open bell that measured nearly 14 inches across at its mouth, which is a pretty large bell. Another much smaller bell was recovered from the sanctuary. Both the 1681 and 1704 inventories list numerous small or little bells. The bell from the sanctuary of San Luis Church is a little hemispherical bell without any evidence of a clapper. It must have been struck with something else to make it ring. Lamps of brass and silver are listed from both inventories of church furnishings and lanterns are listed on the 1681 inventory. At the west wall of the counter sacristy, we located a concentration of over 200 fragments of thin iron sheet with a coating of gray metal on one side. There were both punched circular and rectangular cutouts in the metal, and they appear to be fragments of a pierced lantern. Part of the lantern's iron handle or bale was recovered from the same context. A fragment of a flat, circular, clear glass disc was recovered from the disturbed area in the clay altar pad, area 382. It would have originally been about four centimeters in diameter. The finished edges are chipped and ground smooth, and it thins out from the center to its finished edge. We think this may be a fragment of a framed reliquary, just the glass lens that might have covered and displayed whatever revered relic it might have held. If the church at San Luis was one of the earliest buildings on the Mission Plaza, did it ever change in any way? I think there is evidence that it was changed, perhaps lengthened at some point. We didn't cross-section many of the posts in the north and south walls, but where we did profile them, at the west end of the nave in the south wall and at the far western end of the church on its north wall, 
we saw a pattern of the bases of the posts alternating between deeper and shallower elevations. This by itself suggests that at some point, posts were about two meters apart and additional posts were needed to support the structure. New posts were in place between the original ones, resulting in post moles about one meter apart in the north and south walls. At two points in the western end of the nave and directly on the lines of the two rows of big interior support posts running the length of the church, we found roughly circular intrusions beneath the burials. The soils within the two intrusions were most similar to post hole fill. The two intrusions were roughly a meter in diameter and extended to about 150 centimeters below surface, a depth matched only by the post holes of the big support posts. It looks like large posts within post holes were once in these two places, but the posts were removed at some point and burials eventually filled in the areas where the posts once stood. Now, of course, this could reflect only an earlier, slightly different configuration of major supports instead of a lengthening of, of the church. There was no evidence that the width or orientation of the church was ever changed. Now, it appears that the Franciscan friars allowed the Appalachians some flexibility in their practice of Catholicism as long as it didn't severely conflict with religious doctrine. The fact that the church and the Appalachians council house both opened onto the central plaza points to a high degree of accommodation between the Spaniards and the Appalachians. For their part, the Appalachians probably incorporated some of their older beliefs into the new. At San Luis, for instance, the Appalachians' celebration of the Feast of St. Louis, their patron saint, fell in late August, close to the time when an earlier harvest festival had once been held. Was the Appalachians' acceptance of the new religion genuine? Well, we may never really know for certain, but there is evidence that it was. By the time San Luis was relocated to this spot in 1656, there were Appalachian adults in their 20s who had known nothing but life in the mission system. In 1675, two literate Indians who wanted to record the origins of the Appalachian ball game had to turn to older Appalachians for that information. Some of the earlier beliefs had already faded. Religious brotherhoods or cofradías were common in Spain and they were formed in Spanish Florida too. The organizations assumed responsibility for charitable works and offered support to the church in many ways. The Apalachi Brotherhood at San Luis was dedicated to Our Lady of the Rosary. When San Luis was abandoned in 1704, one group of Apalachis went west and abandoned the Spaniards as well. They settled among the French in their new settlement of Mobile. One of the French priests recorded that the Appalachians dressed like Europeans and spoke a mixture of Spanish and their native tongue. The priest said the Appalachians were constantly asking for religious sacraments, even though at first the Appalachians and the priest could barely understand each other. At one point, the Appalachians threatened to leave Mobile unless a friar was assigned to them. It's just amazing to think of an Appalachian choir singing the mass in the 17th century, or of the baptisms, marriages, and funerals that took place within the mission church at San Luis. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the church, and I thank you for listening.